Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, uh, Mr. The Chairman, for those nice words. And I would also like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to, uh, to present an update on an area that's very close to my heart. And so this is the area of growth hormone deficiency in adults. Now, most of you know that with the advent of recombinant technology, there was abundant growth hormone worldwide for clinicians like ourselves to start asking the question as to whether growth hormone might bring benefit as a form of hormone replacement therapies. So the first studies were undertaken in the late 80s with consensus guidelines published in JCEM about 10 years later. So I'd like to give you an update in the field as well as going over some old ground where there are uh, just uh, fantastic data which has stood the test of time. So over the next 45 minutes, I'd really like to take you through just four areas. What are the consequences of adult growth hormone efficiency? Who should we be testing? How should we be testing? And focus on some aspects of patient, patient management. Now, growth hormone and its use in pediatrics is well known to you. So on the left are two siblings. You can see that the elder of the two boys is uh, three brick lengths shorter than his younger brother because he's got growth hormone deficiency. And 12 months later, you know, he has grown, let me see, one, two, three brick lengths, and his younger brother has grown one. So there's a striking uh, example of the biology of growth hormone uh, as a growth promoting agent, all well known to you. Less well known is the fact that underlying growth and skeletal elongation is the fact that growth hormone is a very, very powerful metabolic hormone. And I'd like to draw you um, to this study well, over 30 years ago now from the Mayo Clinic, looking at the effects of growth hormone on body composition in hypopituitary dwarfs. And this plots um, the observations of changes in body cell mass shown in dark pink extracellular water in yellow and body fat mass in turquoise. So in a group of growth hormone deficient children shown here, followed for six months, placed on growth hormone for the subsequent 12 months, and then followed for a further six months. So if you look at body cell mass expressed as a percentage of body weight here, you can see that on commencement of growth hormone, there is an increase in body cell mass which is what you would expect, because the child's growing. Concomitantly, there's an expansion of extracellular fluid volume, and that's a property of growth hormone. And there is a marked reduction in body fat, shown here in green. And you might say, well, so what? Because the child is growing, and that's why you have more uh, body water and body cell mass. But on cessation of growth hormone, and you can see there's a shrinkage of the body cell mass reaccumulation of body fat and loss of extracellular water. So this occurs at a time when there is no further change in growth. So um, in the absence of growth, you can see this remarkable change in body composition. And we've now come to recognize that you know, growth hormone functions throughout age and its secretion rises two to threefold during puberty and following that, there's a steady decline and there's a huge amount of controversy as to whether the age-related decline constitutes a treatable form of disease. But be that as it may, um, in addition to the biological effects of growth hormone in growth and development, there is this lifelong metabolic effect, and this underlies the theme of my talk. And this can be best illustrated uh, in one of the studies which we did early on, so we recruited a group of growth hormone deficient adults, gave them two, in, into two groups, and followed them over 12 weeks of treatment at a low dose and a high dose, three and six micrograms per kilogram per day. And you looked at effects on resting energy expenditure. You can see that growth hormone induces an increase, a sustained increase in resting energy expenditure in a dose-dependent manner. We looked at um, effects on fat utilization. And this is the good thing, that's what you want. You want growth hormone burning fat. It kicks up in a dose dependent manner. 
And of course, over a 12 week period, if you're expanding more energy, and most of that energy you're burning comes from fat, you would expect a loss <coughs> in body fat. And this is exactly what we found you know, in a dose dependent change. So it makes perfect sense. Well, we now recognize that adults with like growth hormone has a cluster of clinical characteristics shown here. Generally speaking, and almost always, they have hypothalamic pituitary disease as a primary cause, abnormal body composition, truncal adiposity, osteopenia, <coughs> and favorable lipid profile, thin dry skin, reduced muscle strength, fitness, and impaired psychological well-being. Now, I'd just like to take you through some interesting uh, other consequences of growth hormone deficiency which may not be well known to you. The skin and the integuments of skin are important target tissues of growth hormone, including control of perspiration. So these are interesting studies from um, the Danish group looking at sweat reduction in a group of growth hormone deficient subjects and, met, uh, and match controls in response to uh, uh, heating in a sauna and a pharmacologic test. So you can see this marked a reduction in the ability to sweat. And that's why these patients do complain of uh, drying of the skin. But more importantly, I think it restricts performance. So the same group put them through a standard uh, exercise test. And um, you can see that during match exercise testing, the amount of sweat produced is half of that of controls. And look at the rise in body temperature, you know, much higher than that of controls. And all of you know that when you go running in the tropical heat of KL, okay, uh, you don't do much exertion because you just boil up internally. And this is one of the reasons why physical exertion is markedly impaired because of an underlying disturbance of the control of core body temperature. And it's really difficult to define, you know, what it is is it that makes these patients uh, unwell? And I think the best example is shown on this slide. They've got all the parts, but they struggle with a wonderful invention, the bicycle. And uh, what Wolf Woman does is it reinvent the wheel for them. And what do these people look like? Well, again, this change is a little bit non-specific. This is a slide given to me by Professor Peter Thompson of a patient uh, diagnosed with a pituitary tumor before surgery, shown here, muscular man, and then 12 months later, <laughs> the onset of growth hormone deficiency post-surgery. I think a picture uh, tells a thousand words. And when you look at a person like this outside the clinical history, well, they can look like any of your professors of medicine after the age of 50. <laughs> So, what has um, treatment experience taught us? Well, you can read this column because at the end of the day, it really corrects all these uh, abnormalities. What is still not clear is whether growth hormone replacement brings down the known increase in cardiovascular mortality observed in this patient group. And I'll just show you some uh, slides uh, of some of these metabolic effects so here is a CT of the abdomen in such a patient before therapy. And in the intra-abdominal area, here in the darker area, is fermental or intra-abdominal fat, and that's subcutaneous fat. You can see the remarkable disappearance of intra-abdominal fat six months after growth hormone therapy, like matched by parallel reduction in subcutaneous fat. And... Uh, there are remarkable effects on human skeleton, although this is an uncontrolled study. So this is from a Dutch group looking at a five-year impact on um, bone mineral density at the lumbar spine in a group of growth hormone deficient male adults. You can see there's a remarkable increase in the percent uh, of bone accretion, and this would not ex an increase like that will certainly not, not occur spontaneously as we age. Many authors have now 
reported reversal of early atherosclerotic changes in these patients after the growth hormone therapy. And this is one of the first papers in the field from the UK group. On the vertical axis is a measurement of intermediate thickness at baseline, uh, I'm sorry, at baseline, in comparison to a group of match controls, so there's greater thickening, and with growth progressive longitudinal assessment, you can see there's a reduction in uh, the intimate thickness of the carotid arteries. What about effects on exercise capacity or physical fitness? And the study from the same Dutch group shows a progressive increase over five years, and the turquoise line shows what would be predicted for a similar group of men um, matched for their age and their weight if they were followed over the other five years. And you all know that if we get older, our VO2 max sadly falls like this, it doesn't go up. A lot has been said about quality of life, and there have been mixed reports in the literature, but I think this is really the best uh, paper in the field. So this is a questionnaire-based evaluation, asking the partner, the spouse, not the patient. And this is a nine-month, two-phase uh, crossover study on growth hormone alone or placebo, and they looked at questionnaires looking at the level of alertness, activity, level of endurance, how much help or work they do around the house, and looking at personal relationships. So in this double-blind placebo control crossover trial reported by the partner, you can see that uh, you really don't need statistics to convince you that there is a marked positive effect on growth hormone. Um, what about its healthcare benefits? Now, this is a notoriously difficult area for assessment. This is not, this is not a perfect study, but at least it is an attempt. The data comes from the uh, you know, Pfizer and Kim's database. So they looked at healthcare utility and quality of life after 12 months of growth hormone therapy. And the control period as the baseline was the preceding 12 months before growth hormone. So this is not double blind, this is not placebo control. But be that as it may, so this is preceding 12 months and 12 months of growth hormone therapy. Look at the number of days of sick leave, that's shrunk. Number of days of hospitalization is reduced. Leisure time activity is increased, so the ability to enjoy life a little bit more is increased. The assistance with daily living is reduced. And this is the quality of life score, where the lower the number, the better your quality of life. And this uh, is improved. So, the published literature tells us that growth hormone deficiency in adults is characterized by a cluster of clinical syndrome that includes metabolic derangements, a normal body composition, reduced physical fitness, and impaired psychological function. And the properties and the manifestations are explained by the effects of growth hormone. However, to date, the contribution to increased mortality in hypopituitarism is not clear. Now I'd like to move on to more pragmatic things. Now who should we be testing? This is an update of recommendation uh, guidelines by the US Endocrine Society and the Growth Hormone Research Society, at least updated to 2007, with the, the Endocrine Society guidelines published in JCEM in the same year. So who should we be testing? Well, we should be testing patients with a history of hypothalamic pituitary disease. We should be testing those who receive cranial radiation or pituitary tumor therapy, surgically. Those, this is a new addition, with a history of traumatic brain injuries or subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is a forgotten group. And adults who previously received growth hormone as children and diagnosed with childhood growth hormone deficiency. I just want to spend a little bit of time on these two. These, this table 
is summarized from a terrific uh, review published in, in a JAMA, looking at the frequency of hypopituitarism after traumatic brain injury or subarachnoid hemorrhage. So it is a meta-analysis. So the authors um, accumulated the numbers after in, in the publications after traumatic brain injury, and there were over 800 such cases. And if you look at the frequency of hypopituitarism after that, of any manifestation of, of pituitary dysfunction, it was about a quarter. And of these affected, half of them had growth hormone deficiency. Mm -hmm. So if you think about traumatic brain injury <coughs> arising from lifestyle-related events, motor vehicle accidents, football injuries, boxing, etc., I think we should be more aware of uh, people out there who are suffering this endocrine uh, deficiency. But what about patients who have suffered from stroke or subarachnoid hemorrhage? Fewer number of patients, just a hundred in the literature, but up to 50% have been reported to have hypopituitarism, and half of these have growth hormone deficiency. So this is a forgotten group. There is no doubt that children who receive growth hormone uh, during their childhood, when they were diagnosed with growth, growth hormone deficiency, should, we, should be retested. We don't fully understand why, but it may be due to this diagnosis. It could be due to the changing uh, st steroidal milieu that changes the growth hormone status. And this is a, a study uh, in over 100 children, looking at um, the number of children who were classified as having severe growth hormone deficiency, defined by a peak growth hormone, more, hormone response of less than 5 nanograms per mil, and those with partial growth hormone deficiency. So in this group of 131 children, about a quarter had severe growth hormone deficiency, and three quarters had partial growth hormone deficiency, and all these kids ended up having growth hormone. And of course, by, de by definition, none of the kids were considered normal. But look at what happened when they retested all these children five or six years later, or at least on completion of growth hormone therapy. Of those who were diagnosed with severe growth hormone deficiency, none well, most of them did not change their diagnosis, or right? they remained severely growth hormone deficient. Of the nearly 100 diagnosed with growth hormone deficiency or partial, only 20 were now regarded as having partial growth hormone deficiency. And the majority, over 80%, are now normal. So we don't retest, and we assume that these people are normal, are growth hormone deficient, then we could be treating a whole lot of people unnecessarily. It's not a unique experience. So that is the um, Richard Chioli study. And these are you know, large groups, and other centers have also reported the prevalence of growth hormone deficiency after retesting a quarter here and about 50% here. Now, which diagnostic test? The ITT uh, is regarded as the gold standard. And uh, these are our early data, published over 10 years ago, looking at the peak growth hormone response to insulin-induced hypoglycemia in a group of normal people and a group of patients who had undergone pituitary surgery and radiotherapy and therefore likely to have growth hormone deficiency. And you can see, and this is a logarithmic scale by the way, so this goes up to about 2 or 3, whereas this starts around 10. So you see there's a clear separation between patients with hypopituitary damage, normal people. So this is the ITT, if you do it well under supervision, it's a terrific test. But our studies also show that IGF-1, which is a growth hormone dependent uh, protein, is actually not a good discriminator, because in the same group you can see there's a marked overlap. But nevertheless, there are a plus of people down here with very, very low IGF-1, were clearly growth hormone deficient. So there's a gradation in the degree of growth hormone deficiency 
um, apparent with IGF-1 measurement, but not clearly identifiable with the ITT. So the take-home message is, if the IGF-1 level in these patients are normal, you cannot exclude growth hormone deficiency. Since then, many centers have looked at a whole range of other stimulation tests. 